we are going to this evening continue with our work in terms of our program. I see that we are only 40 plus on this platform now, considering that we are well over 100, means that some still have to join us. I'm just going to remind you of our ground rules again so that we can have a smooth process and make good progress. Please ensure that your microphone is on mute at all times. It is distracting when any sound comes from any of you. you we lose our thought processes and then it uh, slows us down. So please, ladies and gentlemen, mute your microphones and make sure they are muted at all times. Once again, with regards to questions, I would suggest that you reserve your questions for before, just before our first break at seven o'clock. And just before our our before we close off at 830 this evening. You may in the meantime, whilst we are proceeding with the, the program. Post any questions you have on the chat. And then a few minutes before the seven o'clock break, I will take time to answer those questions. Just to go back a bit to the topics that we discussed the other day on Monday and on Tuesday. Someone asked if there are answers to the to the assessment questions. Yes, the response was it is on. Part F of the book of the the book, the training notes, and that is found at page 188 of your manual. Page one double eight of the manual contains contains the the answers. But once again, I would like to urge you to attempt to answer the questions on your own. It will test your own knowledge as to whether you understand the the issues. Then I would also like to add that. What we had discussed the last two days as well can be found on pages one from pages 191 onwards. And on 191 you have your letters of demand. 192 you have your letter of demand in terms of section 19 of the Alienation of Land Act, as well as section 129 of the National Credit Act. On page 193 you have the answers to jurisdiction as well as how to cite parties. So all the answers can be found. In on those pages. There will be reference to. Annexures. Which is a list of authorities. Annexure B is a list of authorities. But before we go to, to Annex B, sorry, I'd like you to look at page 214, 214, which is the definitions as contained in the rule in rule two of the act. Page 216 is an annex, annexure G, annexure A actually, which is heads of argument criminal, but the same principles apply. It is just to show you what heads of argument look like. We will be dealing with that later on. And annexure B to that is the list of authorities referred to in those heads of argument. Then you also have what we call 
judicial precedents. Some of you refer to them as templates. Page 240 has a template of a founding affidavit in the magistrate's court for eviction. Page 244 also has an example of that. And I will be dealing with the other annexures or the examples as we proceed. It is also advisable that when when you are reading your notes in preparation, that you have a copy of the rules of the magistrate's court with you as well, because the relevant rules contain the wording used in respect of every rule and every pleading affidavits and notices are drafted in terms of the rules. And at the back of your rules, you have what is referred to as forms, different forms, which are the, pre, the, the precedents that I referred to earlier on. And you will find one in, in those forms on, on, on basically every single notice that you can think of. There are quite a number of them. Right, this evening we are going to then start with undefended actions. If you remember, we said we are going to start with. Proceedings, the different types of proceedings. There are three actions, applications and provisional sentence proceedings. We have started with actions. And yes, up to yesterday, we had dealt with. The different types of claims. As well as causes of examples of causes of action. Today we are going to start with undefended actions. And. We are on page 90 for those who would like to follow as per the notes. When a party institutes legal proceedings by way of action. In other words, the plaintiff. When the plaintiff issues summons. And the defendant has what is referred to as a bona fide defense. That defendant will then defend the action. In doing so, that defendant will file a notice of intention to defend or it is also referred to a notice of appearance to defend. Indicating his or her or its intention to so defend the action. However. Where a defendant does not have. A defense. That defendant will not necessarily file an appearance to defend or a notice of intention to defend. Either because the party admits its indebtedness to the plaintiff or it admits that the plaintiff is entitled to the relief that the plaintiff is seeking. As I said, by admitting the debt, the defendant will then choose to either pay the debt if he is in a position to do so in full or offer to pay the debt in installments if he is not able to pay the debt in full. And it is up to the plaintiff to either accept the, the, the payment in full or in installments or not to accept. And where where there is no offer of, of, of settlement by way of admitting and offering to pay the by the defendant, the plaintiff has certain options available. 
Now, one such option by the plaintiff is to apply for default judgment against the defendant. And it's easy to remember because all you need to do is look at the defendant has look at it as follows. The defendant has not done anything to defend the action, so he has defaulted. So the plaintiff may then, in terms of Rule 12, apply or request default judgment against that defendant. And such default judgment is deemed as an admission of the claim by the defendant. Now, in order for a plaintiff to apply for default judgment, there are certain requirements that have to be met by the plaintiff. First of all, the plaintiff must show that the defendant has failed to enter an appearance to defend within the time limit specified in the summons or before the plaintiff has lodged a request for judgment by default. Now this will happen, as I said last night, in the summons when the plaintiff prepares the summons. The plaintiff will specify in the summons that the defendant, if the defendant so wishes to defend the action, must do certain things by a specific time. And such examples are that the defendant has to file an appearance to defend within 10 days or 20 days, but the summons will specify the time period within which the defendant must file an appearance to defend. And if that defendant has not filed that appearance to defend, the plaintiff may then apply for default judgment. That is the first requirement. The second requirement is that the defendant has not consented to judgment. In other words, the defendant has chosen to remain supine, not do anything, sit back and relax or not even bother. And those requirements are in terms of Rule 12, 1A of the, the rules of the Magistrates Court. Rule 12, 1A, 1 capital A. Now there is another instance where default judgment may be granted against the defendant. And that is the procedure in terms of Rule 12, 1, capital B. And this is where the defendant has filed to deliver his plea timelessly. So this defendant, after receiving summons, actually filed an appearance to defend, indicating his intention to defend the action. But after having filed the intention to the appearance to defend, the defendant failed to file his or her plea within the time specified to do so. Now, after the filing of an appearance to defend, the play the defendant has a period of 10 days within which to file his plea. And if that defendant fails to file his plea after having filed an appearance to defend, the plaintiff may, in terms of Rule 12, 1 capital B, apply for default judgment against that defendant. But before applying for default judgment, and the plaint and the defendant failing to file a plea, the plaintiff must first place the defendant under bar. And how do you place the defendant under bar? When the 10 days for filing the plea have expired, the plaintiff will send a notice to the defendant to say, Mr. Defendant, you were supposed to file your plea within 10 within 10 days. 
The 10 days have now expired and you've still not filed your plea. So now I am putting you under bar. This is a notice. You have five days within which to file your plea. And if you do not file your plea within five days, you will be barred from filing it. Then, and only then, may you apply for default judgment where there has been an appearance to defend filed. Look at the cases on page 91, Spielman. In Spielman, the court held that there was no merit in the argument that the five days allowed for the filing of the plea ran from the date of delivery of the notice to the clerk of court. And the court held that Route 12 required that a copy of the notice must be delivered to the clerk of court, but the notice must give the defendant who received it five days from the date of receipt of the notice within which to comply with it. So it's it's five days of receipt of that notice to file a plea and not five days of the date of the plea. So if the plea, plea is is dated the 17th of August, but is only served on the 20th of August or, or the 22nd of August. Then the five days will run from the 22nd of August and not the 17th of August. That is what was decided in the Spielman versus Duncan case. In Santam and others, Bamba, you will also read the principle there. But uh, the court looked at the intention of the defendant. Because the 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 plaintiff applied for default judgment. On the day before on the day. After the plea had been the fee, the plea had been filed one day late. Plea was delivered to the plaintiff by the defendant one day late. And instead of the the, the, the plea being filed at court with the clerk of court as well. It was not filed, but the plaintiff was aware that the defendant had filed its plea, be it late. The court there on appeal found that the intention of the defendant was to defend the case at all times and therefore irrespective of the, the plea having been filed one day late, the plaintiff was aware of it and the defendant had intended to defend that action. And there were there were certain issues, certain referrals to the Legal Practice Council as well. Because. Um, I, I beg your pardon to the to the. Certain certain ethical issues were raised by the court because with, with the conduct of the legal practitioner, because that legal practitioner, even though the appearance to defend was not filed in court, it was brought to the attention of the legal practitioner for the plaintiff, timelessly so, although it was one day late, but they were aware of the intention to defend the action. Default judgment applications are done in terms of Rule 60, Sub Rule 3, amongst others. And that rule provides that Where any order made under sub rule two is not fully complied with within the time so stated, the court may on application give judgment in the action against the party so in default or may adjourn the application and grant an extension of time for compliance with the order on such terms as to costs and otherwise as other and otherwise as may be just. 
I just read from the actual rule concerned. Rule 32, sub rule 2 also provides that if a case has been set down for trial, in other words, all the pleadings and all the notices have been filed, the parties are ready to go to court to argue the case, to present their cases, to lead their various evidence and the witnesses in court in support of their cases. Where what the defendant fails to appear in court on that date when the case is set down for trial, the plaintiff may request the court to grant default judgment in its favor, his or its favor. But there is a proviso to that. The matter must have been properly enrolled for trial. In other words, the date of trial must have been applied for to the registrar, I mean to the clerk of court, or the registrar if it's the high, if it's the, 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 the regional court. The registrar or the clerk of court will then have considered dates and provided the parties with dates. And that is done by way of a notice which is issued to both parties by the registrar or the clerk of court. And at court, various attorneys have pigeonholes in which their correspondence is placed. Notices and orders are placed in there. Can the person whose microphone is on please mute your mic? Please ensure that everyone's mics are muted. Thank you. There's someone's mic on. Thank you. Then both parties become aware of the date. It is the plaintiff's duty then to serve on the defendant a notice of set down of the date of trial. That is what you call the trial being enrolled properly for trial. And only when that has happened, may the plaintiff, when the defendant does not come to court on the date of trial, apply for default judgment. And the magistrate may then either grant default judgment in favor of the plaintiff or refuse default judgment or remove the matter from the role or postpone the matter to a further date. Somebody's mic is on. Can you please you all make sure that your microphones are muted? Please, guys, let's 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 continuously check that we are muted. It's it's distracting and it hampers our progress. So practically, when a plaintiff applies for default judgment, in terms of both Rule 12.1a and 12.1b, the plaintiff must lodge a written request for judgment. It's a document that states on top, request for default judgment. It will have on the page, it's normally a one-page document, and it will have at the top the name of the court, the case number, the names of the name of the plaintiff, the name of the defendant. And then it will set out. And these are the these are the allegations which the plaintiff must prove in support of its application. It must it must it must. Allege that the original summons is there as well as the original return of service. Now the original return of service. Is a document compiled by the sheriff of the court in satisfaction that the sheriff had served an original a copy of the original summons on the defendant either personally or by any of the other means that are accepted acceptable service in terms of the rules 
Now, in the case where the originals, the original summons or the or, and or the original return of service are not available for whatever reason. The plaintiff or the plaintiff's legal representative or legal practitioner must file an affidavit explaining why the originals are not available. And only if the court is satisfied with that explanation in that affidavit, will the court gr grant default judgment in favor of the of the plaintiff against the defendant. Now, which type of causes of action may a court consider? Or may a plaintiff request judgment for? Rule 12, 1A specifies that the, the cases in which a court may, uh, in which default judgment may be requested for are as follows. And it's under 12, 1A Roman numerals. Any sum not exceeding the amount claimed in the summons. So if it's more than the, the amount claimed in the summons, you will not be awarded default judgment. It's either the amount claimed in the summons or a lower amount. Any other relief claimed in the summons. So if it is for, for eviction, you may request eviction in your default judgment request. If it is for the cost of the action, you may be, you may request judgment in favor of the costs of the action. If it is the interest at the rate specified in the summons to the date of payment, then you will be entitled to request judgment for the, on that interest rate. Or if there is no interest rate, you may refer to the interest rate as specified in the in, in, in terms of the prescribed rate of interest act. Now we all know that the, the interest rate fluctuates on a regular basis. So you will be entitled to interest at that rate when it is applicable. Now, the sheriff, as we said, is the person who is authorized in terms of the law to serve all processes on parties in legal proceedings. And this includes summons. Only the sheriff can serve a summons. Now, if for whatever reason it is not possible for the sheriff to serve a summons in the ordinary way. The sheriff may serve summons by registered post. And that sheriff must then render a return of service in which it is stated that service was effected by registered post. And the sheriff must attach the proof of such registered post. When you send anything by registered post, you receive a slip, a registered slip. And there's also something called nowadays a track and trace. So you can actually trace whether that document, that registered post has been sent and delivered and even collected by the person to whom it was addressed. So your request for default judgment, as I said, must bear a case number as well as the court and the parties, the names of the parties, but make sure that it is the correct case number that is reflected on the request for default judgment. 
where you have put the incorrect number on, on your request for default judgment, you will not be granted your default judgment. In fact, the clerk of the court or the registrar may not even entertain your request because once they receive it at their offices, they will look for the file and if it's not the correct case number, they will tell you it's not the correct case number. Take your document, please, and go back and find the correct case number for us because the number you have cited on your request for default judgment refers to another case which has nothing to do with your case. Right. The And just like with pleadings, a request for default judgment must be signed either by the plaintiff, him or herself, or by a legal practitioner. No other person may sign a request for default judgment. A husband cannot sign on behalf of a wife. A mother cannot sign on behalf of her 18-year-old son. The plaintiff, him or herself, must sign if they are not represented legally by a legal practitioner. Now we spoke about liquidated and unliquidated claims. In the case of Fatty's Engineering, a company PTY Limited versus Vendix Pairs, which is the citation on page 94 of your notes, the following was said by the court. When the amount is due upon a contract and the exact amount due is simply a matter for calculation from figures in books, the claim is a liquidated one. When a contract of sale is concluded and there is no express agreement as to the price of the article sold, it is an implied term of the contract that a reasonable price will be paid for the article. This is to say a price ordinarily charged by persons who deal in such articles at the time and place of the sale. Similarly, where a contract for the rendering of services is concluded and the parties do not agree as to the remuneration to be paid therefore, it is an implied term of the contract that a reasonable remuneration will be paid for such services. Such remuneration depends on what is regarded as reasonable in that particular trade or profession. In our organized society with business, trades and professions organized, as they are, it is normally a matter of no difficulty to determine the usual and amount market price of articles sold and the reasonable remuneration for services rendered. These are matters which, as a rule, can be ascertained speedily and promptly. So a liquidated claim is not a necessarily a specific amount. It is an amount which can be ascertained speedily and promptly. And the suggestion here is that you look at the market related pricing in the case of contracts. And that is in, in business or trades and professions. And that is where you will then be able to say it is easily ascertainable. Now, in respect of unliquidated claims, unliquidated claims are said to include claims for damages where the quantum has not been ascertained by agreement or otherwise. And last night I made the example of a claim for medical negligence where a party, a person is suing the MEC for health. There are items for which the plaintiff is suing the MEC, such as loss of income, which is not ascertainable at the time because the services of an actuary have to be employed to calculate if the person, the plaintiff or the injured person, will have been able to follow a certain profession. And there too, you need the services of an industrial psychologist to first determine what type of profession the person may have followed. And then factors that are taken into consideration there are as to 
whether the person was ever employed. If it's a minor child who has not worked yet and will never be able to work, it has to be ascertained what type of work that that minor child will have would have done if that child had lived a normal life. Would that child have reached normal milestones? What is the family history in terms of the education and the career paths of that child's family? Those are all the things that are taken into consideration to determine. So in other words, they are not easily ascertainable at the time. And for that reason, such claims are considered to be unliquidated. Or as we said earlier on, not capable of being ascertained speedily and promptly. Another example is a claim for reasonable remuneration for services rendered, where that remuneration is not fixed by a trade usage or custom. Let's say it's 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 a gardener who works on a part time basis. The you may pay your gardener 300 rands per day. But your next door neighbor pays his gardener 200 rands a day. Well, you may call it exploitation by your, your neighbor, but the fact remains that you decide to pay your gardener more than your neighbor does. That makes it unliquidated. So if you're unless you have a specific agreement between yourself and your gardener that this is how much is going to be paid, your neighbor's gardener cannot institute a claim against his boss for payment of 300 rands when he has agreed to 200 rands. Maybe it's not such a good example in the in the case, but the illustration is there that there is no industry, a trade usage or custom that determines the prices for gardeners. Once again, it's probably a bad example because there is a minimum wage with, that the Department of Labor sets out. But I think you should you understand the rationale behind there being a fixed trade usage or custom where there simply isn't one then then that claim can be said to be unliquidated if the parties agree to the amount such as the the, the gardener i've just made the example of then that can then that unliquidated claim can become liquidated because the amount is now fixed and it's agreed upon between the parties. I see there are some questions there already. Um, I will respond to them shortly. Well, let me look at them now. Zanele Maseko wants to know if a defendant ignores the slip to collect the letter from post office, the case will not move right as he has not received the summons. Then what? Can an email address provided by the defendant be used? All right, let's first start with the first question. Zanele, if a defendant ignores a slip or free or fails to collect that slip. It's that defendant's fault. There has been case law that's gone as far as the Supreme Court of Appeal in which it was decided that if a party can prove that the and this was in terms of the National Credit Act litigation in terms of the National Credit Act, if that party can prove that the letter, the registered post was sent to the correct post office, he, that party will have done enough. It is to the detriment of the defendant that that defendant failed, refused or neglected to collect that letter. So that question of yours has come up in litigation, but it was settled by the Supreme Court of Appeal when it was held that all the, pl the plaintiff has to prove is that it has sent the letter to the correct post office, whether the whether the defendant collected it or not is not the plaintiff's problem. So because people deliberately refused or failed to, to, to collect 
uh, registered post. And for that reason, a plaintiff was left with no remedy because of an evasive defendant. Now the next, I hope that answers your question. Now the next question uh, looks like it's from Zanele Maseko too. Can an email address provided by the defendant be used to forward the summons instead of the good old post office? With the usage of electronic or digital formats, more and more in our society, our courts have also become flexible in dealing with, with service of processes on parties. An email address can be used to forward a summons to a person instead of, as you say there, to quote you, the good old post office. And we also know that the good old post office is becoming redundant now. More and more of them are closing on a daily basis. And I think PostNet is, as, is, is slowly going to replace that post office. But to take the matter even further, and where, and where one wants to serve by email address, you can even bring an application to court to ask the court to give you authority to serve, to be able to serve that process by email. <clears throat> but the sheriff must serve that process by email if it's summons. And the sheriff must then render a, a, a return of service that he or she has served that person by email. And the good thing about email these days is also that you are able to print a read receipt. So you are able to tell whether that person has received and has read the email, which will include the summons that was sent to them. To take it even further than that, I know of instances, in fact, I was involved in, in a case where it was not even possible to email this the, the the documents. It was not a summons, but it was legal process to serve this application on this person by email because we did not even have his email address. But my very diligent attorney managed to find that this person has a Facebook page and they are quite active on their Facebook page. And we asked the court to give us authority to serve that person with, with those papers on Facebook. There, are, there, there is authority in many cases too where that has been done. So take your question on the registered slip and the email address even further. You can even use social media. And nowadays we even have WhatsApp. I've seen cases in which parties have requested to serve someone with process on WhatsApp because the person reads WhatsApp. And luckily with WhatsApp, you have blue ticks now. You can force, you can prove that the person has actually received and read the message and the document. So yes, social media is taking things to another level. In default judgment applications, when that application, that request for default judgment comes to court, and more courts these days are, most magistrates' courts are now requiring that default judgment applications are, are heard in open court, where it is recorded electronically, and it, there's a record that's available, because parties now, when they want to bring an application to rescind that judgment, must be able to have a record on which to rely. Or if you want to appeal against a default judgment that was granted erroneously for whatever reason, then you must be able to have a record. And it's for that reason now that default judgments are heard in open court. In some 
uh, in some requests for default judgment, especially where it is an unliquidated claim that is not easily ascertainable or speedily ascertainable, the court may require that the plaintiff leads viva voce evidence, oral evidence, or files an affidavit in which it sets out its its um, it supports its claim for default judgment. And in in damages claims, they are often referred to as referred to as damages affidavit, especially where you have a motor vehicle accident claim. The court will require you, although it's a it's a, it's a it's a liquidated claim. The court may require you to file a damages affidavit to set out your cause of action. Right, uh, Saisha has a question. Do you have to provide consent to service electronically? Or if you serve yourself, is it necessary to do a service affidavit? First question. Uh, yes, first of all, the parties must consent, consent to serving summons electronically. But remember at that stage, the parties, the, the defendant is not represented. So the issue of serving electronically has not come into question yet, unless you and or the sheriff are experiencing difficulty serving in the normal way. Serving electronically is a last resort after 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 registered post. So if the sheriff is unable to serve via uh, via normal processes by personal service, by affixing to the property, if if it's not possible to serve in any of those normal ways, the sheriff will then resort to serving by registered post. And with the registered post, you only need to show that it's been sent to the correct post office. As to whether the defendant actually collected it or not is a different story. But you must show then that you've served in the correct address. Where the sheriff is unable to serve or by any of these means, and the attorney wishes to serve him or herself. Now remember, others, other than the sheriff, only an attorney may serve legal process, including summons. In extraordinary circumstances where the sheriff is not able to do so. Then, and only then, may an attorney serve. And where an attorney has served summons or any other document on the defendant, the attorney must do a service affidavit. Only when it is not the sheriff. I hope I've answered your question. The questions, Saisha. Zamokwake wants to know. If we have received an order to serve with EG Facebook, do we have to attach an order grant to serve with Facebook? Yes, Zamokwake, you must also attach the order that gives you the authority to serve via Facebook. Okay. I would suggest that you serve the order at the same time because for sure it will come into question if that person decides to defend that action. One of the things they may want to ask is how was this? How did you serve me via Facebook? Whereas the normal ways of service are uh, you have not even said that you followed those ways. Then only when they receive the court order as well as the application papers in respect of the order giving them authority to serve via Facebook, will they then become aware of it? So it's good perhaps to give them the order at the same time. 
on Facebook. If the defendant has not defended the case, in other words, no appearance to defend has been filed, the plaintiff is only entitled to costs on the undefended scale. Which makes sense. Because it was not defended. Obviously, that is a lower rate than a defended case. It will be less work being done by the plaintiff's attorneys. Attorney and client costs in default judgment applications may only be awarded by a court if there was an agreement between the parties that the plaintiff will be entitled to attorney and client costs. Attorney here is also a legal practitioner. But a magistrate may under no circumstances, even if the parties have agreed, grant an order for costs on attorney and own client scale. I think that is actually redundant because Cli attorney client costs and attorney and own client costs are the same thing. It boils down to the same thing. It has been decided in court cases that it means the same thing. So spe specifying that it's an own attorney and own client costs is, is, is a redundancy, I believe. But in your spare time, go and look it up. Look it up on Safley, Google it up. Um, attorney and own client costs the difference between the two. So when you are applying for default judgment, there is a suggested checklist that you should that you, you should consult that will make it easy for you to. To make sure that you get default judgment. First of all, you ask yourself the question, was the summons properly served? Sorry, properly issued by the court. Was the date stamp? put on by the clerk of the court on the date of issue. Because when a defendant decides to rescind that judgment, they will look for all of these technical technical points. If it's the wrong case number, if it's the wrong court, if it's the wrong parties, anything that may be wrong may be sufficient grounds for a rescission of that default judgment. Thirdly, was the summons signed by both the clerk of court and the plaintiff or his legal practitioner? Does the summons have a case number and is it a proper case number? Were all amendments to the summons initialed by the clerk of court before service was effected? Are the parties properly cited in accordance with the requirements of Rule 6? Do the particulars of claim disclose a cause of action? Does the court have jurisdiction? Does the summons contain a prayer for interest? And if so, is it the correct rate of interest? Is a particular rate of interest claimed or is it interest merely claimed at the legal rate? And there it is suggested that the present prescribed rate is 10.5% per annum. I believe it's 10.75 at the moment. Is a date given from which the defendant is alleged to be in mora? And if so, what is the factual, factual basis for that? And it must be alleged in the papers. Were the correct DAs in Dukiai specified in the summons? In other words, was the defendant given 10 days within which to defend the action? And did those 10 days actually lapse? Are the costs, if the action is undefended, reflected on the face of the summons? It's another requirement. When you issue summons, on your summons must be indicated the costs to which the, defend, the plaintiff is entitled should the, the defendant not defend the action. And that alone may be a reason for the defendant not to, to defend the action. if. He or she does not have a bona fide defense. 
has the return of service been attached to the summons and was the summons properly served is the next question you must ask yourself. And if a written agreement is rely upon, it should be filed. In other words, a contract, if it's a written contract, it must be attached to the based on a liquid document. Is the original thereof attached to the summons? And once again, if the original is not available, you must produce an affidavit by your by your client, the plaintiff, which sets out why it cannot or should not be made available. Maybe it's it's in a vault somewhere kept safe. Or somewhere, but you must set out the reason for that. Uh, for instance, a mortgage bond or registration papers of a motor vehicle, those are normally kept in the safe of a bank. And the bank may be reluctant, reluctant to 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 take that document, the original out to be taken to court. Because those documents get lost and they are sacred documents, original title deeds. Those documents are sacred documents. And then now in your request itself, does your request have the correct case number and other parties referred to correct? And are they the same as in your summons? Then you ask yourself, does the amount for which judgment is requested coincide with the amount claimed in the summons or is it a lesser amount? And, la and then you ask yourself the question, does the interest claimed coincide with that claimed in the summons? And lastly, you ask yourself, is the date from which interest is claimed correct? And also, if the plaintiff is entitled to interest from that date on which claim from which interest is claimed. Right, any questions? There's one. Oh, that was Saisha's one. Okay. Samokwake, okay, I've answered your question too. Okay. Right now, judgment rule eleven judgment by consent. Rule eleven provides for judgment for consent to judgment. In other words, a party may apply, may consent to another party taking judgment against it. In this case, the defendant will admit the plaintiff's claim and the defendant will consent to the plaintiff taking judgment against it. It is a rather drastic step. And remember, any judgment against a defendant or a litigant will be reported to the credit bureau. You must have heard the term you've been listed on the credit bureau. This is what they refer to. So do not just easily consent to a party taking judgment against you. If you can, if a defendant can, that defendant should rather try to negotiate with the plaintiff to settle the debt in a way that is acceptable to that plaintiff. And as they say, you beg, borrow, or you steal, uh, but please don't steal to satisfy a debt. Right, it is frowned upon in society, especially in the legal profession. Now, admission of liability and to pay debt in installments. Now, in addition to judgment by consent, the defendant may also, after receiving summons, admit his or her liability to the plaintiff and then make an offer to pay the debt in installments. Normally, this happens when 
these big financial institutions such as banks, credit providers, institute legal proceedings against their clients who are now their debtors because they have for some reason defaulted on their payments, their installments, either for a house or a car or some other asset. The bank then applies for default judgment and on the day of the hearing of the default judgment application, the, the defendant goes to court or even before then goes to the bank and says, look, man, I know that I'm behind and things, you know, but I've, I was affected by COVID. I lost my job. I only recently started working. I'm earning half the salary that I used to earn. And I'm unable to pay that high installment. The banks are so unreasonable in that they will not entertain you. It is only at the doors of the court where when that defendant stands up in court when the case is called, tells the court the same story regarding the COVID-19 pandemic and the effects of losing his job and earning less uh, of his salary than he used to earn, that that defendant will find sympathy with the court. The court will tell that plaintiff bank or credit provider that you are being unreasonable. The defendant says that he's gone to your offices to negotiate with you after you issued summons and you refuse to listen. You were unreasonable. If you do not, we are going to stand the case down. And if you do not entertain the defendants or consider the defendants offer reasonably, then the bank uh, then the court will, will have to intervene to make a reasonable order in respect of this request. So then it's up to the parties to then record that settlement in writing. Uh, the bank will consider, or the creditor, the plaintiff will consider reasonable offers to settle the debt. And reasonable offer means an offer that is not ridiculous. If you owe the bank one million rands, you cannot offer an amount of 100 rands per month to settle the arrears of one million rands. You will never finish it. Not in a million years. Well, maybe in a million years, but uh, at one at one thousand at one hundred rands a month. So yes, it, it that is not reasonable. However, in a in a claim where <clears throat> you have arrears of you are being sued for one hundred thousand rands. Page ninety nine. You are being saved. You are being sued for one hundred thousand rands, and the defendant then makes an offer to settle the 100,000 rands in installments of 10,000 rands per month. That is a reasonable offer. That may be considered to be a reasonable offer. Rosalind, we are on page 99. So that offer must be recorded and it must be it, the full particulars of that offer must be set out. You must the the defendant's monthly or weekly income and expenditure must be set out. But it must also be supported by a reasonably possible by the most reasonable the most recent proof in the possession of the defendant. Other court orders or agreements, if any, with other creditors for payment of a debt of costs in installments and indicate the amount of the offered installment. That is what the offer must entail. It must include all of that information. OK, then there's also. A. Consent to judgment.
if there is a written request to the to the clerk of the court or the registrar of the regional court. And if any person after receiving a letter of demand or a summons. That person then consents in writing to judgment in favor of the plaintiff. That request must be for default judgment must be accompanied by the following. If no summons has been issued and only a letter of demand. OK, that letter of demand must be there. The defendant's written consent to judgment because you can get judgment against the person without having issued summons against them. Then the plaintiff, the, the, the clerk of court will enter judgment in favor of the plaintiff for the amount of the debt and the cost for which the defendant has consented to judgment. And if that defendant has also consented to, in writing to, to pay the debt in installments or otherwise, as well as costs that he has consented to, the clerk of court may order that defendant to pay the judgment debt as well as costs in installments or otherwise. And that order, which the which the clerk of the court then issues shall be deemed to be an order of the court as mentioned in section 65a which as we said last night is our debt collection procedure we have a hand up Did someone have their hand up? No, oh, OK. OK, so on page 100, then you find the difference between the procedure created by section 57 and that created by section 58. All right, I'm now going to allow time for questions on what we have covered so far. All right, so was it that clear? If that is the case, then we are going to move along to defended actions. Now, we've just dealt with a scenario where a case, a, a claim for damages is in a summons is not defended. We are now going to look at what if the claim is defended in the summons. What steps are available to a defendant when he or she decides to defend an action? Now, first of all, when a party wishes to defend an action, a defendant in this case, that defendant must deliver a notice of intention to defend. And that is a notice of intention to defend speaks for itself. It tells your client. You are now. Making known your intention to defend this case. And. Normally. That intention to defend or appearance to defend must be served on the plaintiff or plaintiff's attorneys 
within 10 days after the sheriff has served it on the defendant. So, and, and there is a period during which the days will not be counted for purposes of filing an appearance to defend. And that is between the 16th of December and the 15th of January. You will see that is a whole month. And when 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 parties when parties engage in, lit, in engage in litigation, the days that will be counted in litigation in an action will be court days, not calendar days. So in other words, weekends and public holidays are not counted. Now, along comes this one month period from December to January. During which. Those days are not counted at all. When you when you count them as a calendar month, they are a month exactly. 30 days, but if you count them as court days, they are prop because you know December has got a lot of holidays. 16 December itself is a holiday. Then you have Christmas Day. Then you have New Year's Day. I think Boxing Day is also a holiday. You have New Year's Day. It's also a holiday. So in addition to the weekends and these public holidays, you have very few actual court days, if they were court days. But for purposes of serving an appearance to defend, they are not to be counted as court days. And they are referred to in legal terms as DA's non. DA's non, non court days. So the sheriff, if the sheriff serves you with, with a summons, serves, serves a defendant with a summons on the 14th of December, that defendant can have parties with that defend that summons over December. And only start counting the 10 days within which to enter appearance to defend from the 17th of January. And the sheriff must deliver that document in the correct manner too. Remember, we have a rule relating to service, which tells the sheriff exactly how he or she must serve documents on the defendant. No other way means of service may be accepted unless in exceptional circumstances. The sheriff's return of service then or the notice of intention to defend when when a defendant enters an appearance to defend within the time period permitted. That appearance to defend must be served. On the plaintiff. Or the plaintiff's attorneys. Or legal representatives as they are called. By taking a written notice to them. If as a defendant, you are not able to litigate on your own, it is advisable that you go and see a firm of attorneys to represent you. You go and see a firm of attorneys to represent you, and they will draft a notice of appearance to defend, and they will cause that appearance to defend to be served. Physically taken to the plaintiff's attorneys. The plaintiff's attorneys will receive the original and two copies. Put a stamp on each copy, take a copy and return the original and a copy to you, the defendant's attorneys. You will then take the original. To the clerk of the court or the registrar of the. Regional court. 
and file the original on the court file. That is how you enter an appearance to defend properly. I see there's a question by Emily. Does that mean then if a summons was served on the 15th of December, the 15th will be counted as the first day and the 16th of January, the second day? OK. The 15th of December is not counted as the first day. The first day will be the 16th of December. Which is a which is a public holiday, so you won't. It is a public holiday anyway. So the first day will be on the sixteenth of January, and the second day will be on the seventeenth of January. So it's exclusive of the first day and the last day. I hope that has answered your question satisfactorily, Emily. Now, a party may want security for costs from another party in litigation. If the defendant is a peregrini, peregrinus, and remember, we said a peregrinus is a person who is a foreigner to this country. Who is. Is a foreigner to this country and therefore. Cannot litigate in this country. Because of some reasons. And however, this person has now become a defendant in an action or even a plaintiff. The party litigating against that, that peregrinus may ask that peregrinus in writing to provide security for costs. Now, security for costs will be considered by the clerk of the court or the registrar of the regional court. based on the reasons for the, 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 the costs. So when a party seeks security for costs, that party must also in the notice of security for costs, set out its reasons and grounds for seeking such security for costs. And one such ground as I've just indicated now or illustrated is that this person is a peregrinus who does not have property or asset or assets in this country. And therefore, I want them to file security for costs should I be successful against them. And that is considered to be one of the common law grounds for seeking security. Because Rule 62 does not specify what grounds, specific grounds, there are for seeking security for costs. And therefore, the common law will be applied when a person seeks costs. You will set out in your request for, for such security for costs, your reasons and grounds for seeking for security of costs against such a party. Zamokwa K. Similane wants to know regarding notice of motion, must it be stamped by the Register of Court first before serving to the other party? Zamokwa K. Notice of motion is in respect of application proceedings. We are dealing with action proceedings at the moment. But yes, a notice of motion must be stamped by the Registrar of Court first or the Clerk of Court before the sheriff must serve it on the other party. It is only in exceptional circumstances where there's no need for the registrar stamp, such as in urgent applications. That 
notice of motion may be served on the other party by someone other than the sheriff without the case number, without the registrar stamp. I hope I've answered you. <clears throat> right now, next we are going to deal with a declaration. A declaration, first of all, is similar to particulars of claim. It is a document which is to be filed by a defendant. In an action where simple summons was served on the defendant. The plaintiff has made use of this of the simple summons procedure and has now served it on the sheriff has now served it on the defendant. The defendant then files an appearance to defend, indicating his intention to, to defend the action. Now, when a defendant files an, an appearance to defend to a simple summons, The plaintiff must, within a period of 10 days, provide the defendant with a declaration, which is similar to particulars of claim, in which the plaintiff sets out fully his or her cause of action against the defendant. Should the plaintiff fail to provide to file that declaration within 10 days. The, the defendant. May serve the plaintiff with the notice of bar. And the notice of bar will tell the plaintiff. You have been given. A notice of appearance to defend. You were to file. A declaration within 10 days. The 10 days have elapsed. You have failed to provide to file the declaration. And therefore, you are now required to file. A a declaration to file your declaration within five days. Failing which. You will be barred. Jacob Leroque wants to know what will happen if that foreign person does not have security. OK, the registrar or the clerk of court determines how security is to be provided. Now, security may, may be by way of. A promissory note or a guarantee from a bank that the person has so much money which will be reserved for purposes of this of this matter. If the, the foreign person or the peregrinus does not have. Or does not file security as is required. The clerk of court or the or the registrar of the of the regional court. Will say will not allow the matter to be. To proceed. In other words, if. If if that foreign person is the plaintiff. The registrar or the clerk of court may dismiss may dismiss the plaintiff's claim. If the foreign person is a defendant, the registrar or the clerk of court may strike out the defense of that person. I hope I've answered you, Jacob. Now coming to exceptions. A defendant who opposes or who defends an action may follow a number of routes. One such route is called an exception in terms of Rule 19. And an exception is a remedy available to a defendant where that defendant raises an objection to the particulars of claim or the summons. Either that the particulars of claim 
or the declaration in the case of a simple summons does not disclose a cause of action or that the plea, if one has been filed, lacks a vermins necessary to sustain a defense. And an exception is deemed a, deci a decision on a point of law which will dispose of the case. In other words, it can end there. If 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 the person raising the exception is successful. Without the case having to go to court to trial and evidence being led to prove one's case. You only need to show that the complaint raised is a legitimate one. Either that the cause of the, 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 the particulars or the declaration. Do not disclose a cause of action or that the plea or lacks of vermins necessary to sustain a defense. And if the court is with you, the court will strike out, will make will make a number of may make a number of 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 orders. One. It may uphold the exception and find that the impugned. Pleading. Is indeed vague and embarrassing. I mean, sorry, does not disclose the cause of action or does not have vermins necessary to sustain a defense, it may order that that plea or particulars or declaration be struck out. Or it may give the party time to cure the defect by either amending its particulars of claim, amending its declaration, or amending its defense in the plea. So an exception is a cheap and speedy method of determining the case. You don't, as I said, you don't have to run all the way through a trial for the court to say to find that there's no cause of action. If there is no cause of action, there is no cause of action. But the court may also. Where a party complains. That a pleading or certain sections of a pleading are vague and embarrassing. Which is one of the grounds. As I said, the first one in respect of a summons is that the summons does not disclose a cause of action. Secondly, that the summons is vague and embarrassing. Where, where a summons is vague and embarrassing, the rule provides that the party complaining must first give the other party an opportunity to remove the complaint within 15 days. And if that party does not remove that complaint within 15 days, the complaining party may set the exception down in court for the court to, to decide whether to, to order them to remove it within 15 days. And where they do go to court on that basis and the court does agree with the party that the pleading is vague and embarrassing, the court will order that party to remove the cause of complaint within 15 days or else the, the, the said pleading or the portion thereof will be struck out. Where the plea does not disclose, where the summons does not disclose a cause of action, or where the plea does not disclose a defense to the plaintiff's claim, the party complaining does not have to give the other party an opportunity to remove the cause of complaint. That party may straight away set that exception down in court for hearing. And if the court is satisfied, that they indeed there is no cause of action or that the plea does not disclose a defense to the claim, the court will order that plea, uh, th that those particulars of claim to be struck out for the plaintiff's claim to be dismissed. It may even order that the plea be struck out 
in other words, the defense is struck out and that the plaintiff's claim be granted in its favor, in the plaintiff's favor. That in a nutshell is exceptions. And an example of when a plea is vague and embarrassing is if it is capable of more than one meaning or if the meaning cannot reasonably be ascertained or it has a determinable meaning, but it's so vague that the excipient does not know what the other party's case is. Lastly, a plea, pleading is vague and embarrassing if the averments or allegations in a pleading that are contradictory and are not pleaded in the alternative are patently vague and embarrassing. Those are the things that you look for if you want to determine whether you can raise an exception on the basis of it being vague, of a pleading being vague and embarrassing. All right, I see that it is one minute past seven. We may take our 15 minute break now and let's meet back here at 16 minutes past seven. Hello? Hello, can I ask a question? Great. So maybe when the lecture returns. I wanted to ask about that final assessment on e-leader. Yeah, uh, I, th I think uh, maybe they can help in 15 minutes time. Now it's a break. Okay. Okay, because it was an admin question I wanted to ask.
We are back. Terence, can you please mute your mic? Can everyone also please ensure that your mics are muted? Thank you. Are there any questions? Uh, yes, I have a question. And who are you, sir? If I may ask. My name is Nasser. Nasser. Yeah. Thank you, Nasser. You may ask your question. <clears throat> All right. So, um, with reference to a peregrinus not furnishing security. All right. What does it? What does it actually imply? Oh, let me just switch it off. I'm sorry. Sorry about that. Okay. Uh, wh what does that actually imply? Uh, does it mean that the, the the court can continue with the case and rule against the peregrinus? In other words, in favor of the defendant? Yes, uh, in, sir. Favor of the, in favor exactly of the plaintiff. What... In favor of the plaintiff. Yes, sir. That is exactly what I explained. Right. If we, if the peregrinus is either a plaintiff or a defendant. Yeah. and is unable to lodge security with the clerk or the registrar of the, of the regional court, then effectively that peregrinus is barred from proceeding with the matter. And the court may grant where the peregrinus is a plaintiff, the court may dismiss that peregrinus's case. Understood. Yeah. Yeah. And, Thank where, you. and where the peregrinus is a defendant, the court may grant judgment against that peregrinus if the peregrinus Understood. fails to file security. Understood. Thank you so much. Pleasure, sir. Tapedi. Thank you, Advocate. I just want to check under Rule 19, does the excipient uh, required to, to own the the, the defendant or the defendant, if it is the defendant, to to warn the uh, applicant to to remedy the defect in the plea before he can move on with the exception. Is it a requirement, or can he he directly uh, lodge an application for exception? Thank you. Okay. Thank you for your question. Now I said that. There are two instances in which, uh, in, in respect of which a party may uh, may accept to either particulars of claim of the plaintiff or the plaintiff may accept to a plea by the defendant. Now, in both instances, when the complaint is that the particulars of claim do not disclose a cause of action, or secondly, where the plea does not disclose a defense. In that case, the excipient does not have to give the, the other party an opportunity to remove the complaint. That excipient may set that exception down for consideration by the court immediately. Now, the other instance in which a party may raise an exception is when the particulars of claim or the plea or something in there is vague and embarrassing. In that instance, when that happens, the excipient must first of all afford the other party an opportunity to remove the cause of complaint before setting the exception down. Have I answered your question? Thank you very much indeed, indeed, Advocate. Thank you. Thank you, Tapedi. Any other questions before we move on? You need to send a mail for, to, for admin. This is an external person running the class. OK. What was the question? Has that been resolved? Samula?
I'm guessing that was in response to Rosalind saying we on break. Doesn't look like a question. There's no question mark there. OK, that seems to have been resolved. Tapedi, you may put your hand down if you don't have anything further to ask. All right, we are going to move along now if there are no questions. But feel free to ask whenever you feel like asking a question. Now, when we are still dealing with defended actions, And we're going to deal with rule 70 now, the plea. The plea is a statement by the defendant in which the defendant replies to the plaintiff's particulars of claim. And in that plea must be contained the defendant's defense to the plaintiff's claim. There are two types of pleas. The first plea is a plea on the merits, in other words, the facts. And the second plea is a special plea. A plea must normally be filed within 20 days after service of the notice of intention to defend. The plea, you must, in a plea, set out in detail, in great detail, the version of the defendant in response to the plaintiff's claim according to the particulars of claim. There are four types of pleas which you can only enter on behalf of the plain of the defendant. First of all, you may admit any allegation in the in the particulars of claim. Secondly, you may deny any allegation in the particulars of claim. You may also confess or avoid any of the allegations in the particulars of claim. You may not plead anything other than that. You may not state the contents of this paragraph are noted. It does not fall within, within any of the four permitted pleas. In fact, it has been held in court cases that where a defendant merely denied or noted an allegation in, a, in particulars of claim, that is deemed to be a de, an admission and not a denial, where you merely noted the, the contents of an, of an, of an allegation. And where a defendant denies an allegation. Let's first deal with the admissions. An admission does not dispute any factual allegation in a particulars of claim. In other words, you agree, you admit the allegation. So therefore, you need not elaborate because you do not take any issue with it. Unless you are elaborating 
for purposes of clarifying why you are admitting a certain allegation. You need not deny, you need not elaborate in a plea. But where you are denying an allegation in particulars of claim, you need to provide an explanation as for that denial. You may not merely file a bare denial. Bare denial is acceptable because it does not present a defense to the claim of the plaintiff. You also need to, when you deny, need to put forward your version as to why you are denying those facts and your explanation or rather your version of the facts as you present them to the court. So a denial be then one of the points that are in issue at the trial of the case. Remember, we are dealing with an action here and it has to go to court for viva voce evidence where it will be tested of its veracity. A bare denial is not admissible. And if the, such a bare denial is contained in a plea, that plea is considered an irregular step and a plaintiff may invoke the provisions of Rule 60 sub Rule A to have that plea considered or declared an irregular step. Pleas are not for legal conclusions. May not make a legal conclusion without a factual basis for that conclusion. In other words, as I said, you need to put a version. And when you plead, you are required to do so with sufficient precision and in sufficient detail to enable the plaintiff to know what case he or she has to meet. They must not be left wondering what case it is they are to meet, because after the, de the defendant has filed a plea, the plaintiff has the opportunity to file a replication to what is contained in the plea. Now we said that in addition to admitting or denying the allegations in particulars of claim, a defendant may co confess and avoid. Here, the defendant admits the facts by the plaintiff but alleges certain other facts which would have the effect of putting a different complexion on the facts given by the plaintiff or the legal conclusion that the plaintiff seeks to draw from the facts pleaded. So it is merely, it is an admission, it amounts to an admission, but on, on different facts. And the onus is on the plaintiff to prove his case then in that case. And whereas the defendant will have the onus to prove the facts which he or she alleges. Because now the facts are still in dispute, but it amounts to an admission.
a defendant may plead as follows. That he or she does not have any knowledge of the facts or allegations pleaded by the plaintiff in the particulars of claim. And this is now a plea that is recognized in the magistrate's court, which has the effect of requiring the plaintiff to prove this allegation while the defendant may not lead evidence to dispute the allegation. So the defendant does not necessarily have to admit or deny or confess and avoid. The, the defendant may just say, I have no knowledge of these facts and I put the, the plaintiff to proof thereof. The plaintiff will still have to prove those facts. And normally, a plaintiff would, a defendant would plead to an allegation which may be as follows. The plaintiff consulted with his legal representatives before deciding to commence these proceedings. That is something which the defendant cannot possess information on and merely says, I have no knowledge. Defendant has no knowledge. And if it was not of any consequence, why would the plaintiff plead such, something like that in, in, in the particulars of claim? So be careful to know which relevant facts to put into your pleadings so that not so as not to attract unnecessary attention towards them the example i just made is such is such an example right now the second type of plea which a defendant may plead is a special plea <clears throat> a special plea is a a legal point It's a legal point which a defendant may raise to the particulars of claim of the plea of the of the plaintiff. And it's a special it's considered a special defense which is used to point out a legal problem in the plaintiff's case and does not necessarily deal with the facts. It may, in some instances, deal with the facts. And I will illustrate to you in a moment. And examples of special pleas are as follows. The dilatory ones are jurisdiction, list pendants, arbitration as a condition precedent to the right to sue. And I will deal with each one now. Jurisdiction, or rather, the lack of jurisdiction. A defendant may raise a special plea that the court lacks jurisdiction to hear this matter and of course has to set out sufficient facts and particularity to support that special plea. The reason may be that the defendant does not reside, carry on business or is employed within the area of jurisdiction of the court. Another reason may be the cause of action did not arise in the area of jurisdiction of the court at all. Those are just examples of where the court could lack jurisdiction in a, according to the to the defendant. The plaintiff therefore owes has the onus to show that despite what the defendant is raising as a special plea for lack of jurisdiction, this court does have jurisdiction and on which grounds that court has jurisdiction. List pendants is another dilatory special plea in which the defendant will say, this court cannot decide on this case because this case, based on the same cause of action and between the same parties, is pending in another court. That may delay the conclusion of this, of this action for that reason. 
a last dilatory special plea may be that of arbitration. And this comes into play where contracts mainly um, in the building or construction industry, they always provide for an arbitration clause that before going to a court of law, the parties must consider arbitration as uh, an alternative means of resolving the issues between the parties. In that case, the court will then be barred from hearing the matter until and send the parties back to arbitration where they must determine the matter before coming to court. Now, there are also special pleas in abatement. Now, these, these claims will summarily stop the action right there. And, the, and one example of a special plea in abatement is prescription and the limitation of actions. Prescription, in terms of the Prescription Act 68 of 1969, relates to the time frames within which a party must institute legal proceedings. And generally, in respect of debts, the time period is three years within which a party must bring that action to court. Unless, of course, for some reason, the party was not able to do so. But where a party raises a special plea that since the cause of action arose, three-year period has lapsed, and the party can no longer institute the claim because the claim has prescribed. If the plaintiff cannot show why they did not institute the claim within the prescribed period of three years, the defendant may succeed on the special plea of prescription and have the claim of the, the, the plaintiff dismissed with costs because it has prescribed. The last special plea in abatement is that of res judicata. In other words, the defendant will say to the plaintiff, by the way, this case, this claim which you have, inst which you have instituted against me has been finalized in another court already. There's a judgment, there's an order in respect of that case, and it's on the same cause of action, and it's the same parties, but it has been finalized. So you cannot now bring this action in this court. Where the court finds that is the case, that case will be dismissed with costs against the plaintiff. Now, your special plea will be contained in your plea on the merits. When you start out your plea, in your drafting, you'll have your heading and you'll have your, you'll have the parties, the names of the parties, the court, the names of the parties, the case number, and the heading, special plea and plea, and plea over. You will start by setting out your special plea. The defendant raises the following special pleas. One, jurisdiction, lack of jurisdiction. Two, prescription. Three, list pendants. You can name as many special, you can deal with as many special pleas in a plea. And when you have done dealing with your special pleas in your same document, at the bottom thereof, you say, in the event that the Honorable Court does not uphold the above special pleas, the defendant pleads over as follows. Then in your plea below the special plea, you will respond to the individual paragraphs in the plaintiff's particulars of claim. 
So your special plea and your plea will be contained in one document. I see there is a question by Emily. Can I then say a special plea may be raised where the plaintiff has failed to comply with the statutory requirements or rules? Emily, you may raise a special plea where the statutory requirements have not been complied with. And one such example is the failure by a plaintiff to deliver a statutory notice to an organ of state before instituting legal proceedings. So your answer, the answer to your question is yes, you may raise a special plea in respect of failure to comply with statutory requirements. Now we are moving on to summary judgment. What is summary judgment? We've spoken about default judgment. We're now going to speak about summary judgment. And summary judgment is just what the word summary suggests. It is an expedient remedy available to a plaintiff where it is clear or where it becomes evident that the defendant has entered an appearance to defend merely for purposes of delay. But you have to, in order to bring such a summary judgment, you may only do so where your claim is in respect of a liquid document or in respect of a liquidated amount of money or for the delivery of specified movable property or lastly for ejectment. Those are the only cases in which you may apply for summary judgment after the plaint the defendant has entered appearance to defend. And that application for summary judgment must be delivered to the defendant or their attorneys within 15 days of the service of the plaintiff on the plaintiff of the plea. So previously you could bring a summary judgment application after the defendant has filed an appearance to defend. There has since been amendment of the rules on the 1st of July 2019 that before a plaintiff can bring an application for summary judgment, the defendant must first file a plea. And if it becomes apparent from that plea that the defendant has not disclosed a, a bona fide defense, the plaintiff may apply for summary judgment against the defendant. Gideon, I'm going to uh, look at your question just after I've completed this. So when, when a party brings an application for summary judgment. The plaintiff must file an affidavit in support of summary judgment, which must contain the following. A verification of the cause of action and the amount claimed, if any, because remember, you can also bring the summary judgment application for delivery of specific specified movable property or for ejectment. You must also, it must, your affidavit must also contain an identification of any point of law upon which the plaintiff relies. It must also contain a statement of facts upon which the plaintiff's claim is based and a brief explanation why the defense as pleaded does not raise an issue for trial or a defense to the plaintiff's claim. 
in your affidavit, you must also make the allegation that you are relying on a liquid document if it is based on that document, and you must attach that document to your affidavit if you have not attached it to your particulars of claim already, or your summons. But in your the if the defendant then wishes to oppose the application for summary judgment because the plaintiff must give the defendant notice. <coughs> Excuse me. The defendant may then file an opposing affidavit. Take notes. It's not an answering affidavit. It is called an opposing affidavit. And because summary judgment is an expedient remedy. No further affidavits are permitted in a summary judgment application. And the judgment application. Will be heard in the unopposed motion court. It does not get postponed. To be moved to the to the opposed court. It is argued in the unopposed motion court. And in most cases. The magistrate is able to give an extempore judgment. After the, the, the summary judgment application has been argued in court. It's that simple and it's that expedient. And the court is empowered to when it rules in a summary judgment application to award costs to the successful party. And the rule is that. Costs will always follow the cause unless there are exceptional circumstances for a party that is successful not to be awarded costs in an application of this nature. <clears throat> Mr Gideon Somdaga. Regarding jurisdiction, what is the rationale? Is it to frustrate the case of the plaintiff or to merely postpone the inevitable hearing of the case? <clears throat> Sir, jurisdiction is an established legal principle of our law. And in order f and jurisdiction is the competence of the court to hear a case. If there was no jurisdiction, there would be no reason or reasonableness, reasonableness in litigation. Because a party who, because then parties would, for purposes of inconveniencing other parties, institute proceedings in courts where they know the other party will never be able to reach especially if a party with deep pockets, lots of money, is the, is, the, is the plaintiff in a case. They would want to take a case to Cape Town, even though Cape Town is, is, is far from where this, the defendant is. The rush, there are many reasons behind jurisdiction. Convenience is one of them. Convenience for the defendant and no inconvenience for the defendant as well. Monetary jurisdiction is there to control which cases go to which court. So it's not for purposes of postponing or the hearing of the case. Not whatsoever. And it's not to frustrate the case of the plaintiff either. The plaintiff needs to do his or her research when they decide to initiate legal proceedings. And for that reason, they have to choose the correct forum for their case. And if you choose the wrong forum, then it is your problem. Then you frustrate your, your own case by choosing the wrong forum because the other party can choose, can raise jurisdiction or lack thereof when they defend that case. 
and that is why we have rules and legislation which are the authority for how we do things in our courts and if those rules are not followed then then the courts will lose authority i hope that is that has explained it to you sufficiently enough but thank you for your question So, right, next we are going to move on to, okay, just briefly then, as I said, the affidavit in support of the summary judgment application, you verify the cause of action and the amount claimed, you identify any port of point of law relied upon, provide a statement of, fact, of facts upon which the claim is based, you provide a brief explanation why the defense as pleased it does not raise any issue for trial. And lastly, what can the defendant do when judgment application is delivered? A defendant can or may give security to the plaintiff for the satisfaction of the court for any judgment, including costs, which may be given. Or the defendant may satisfy the court on affidavit I mean, the, the, that the defendant does have a bona fide defense and, in, and where that is the case, disclose fully the nature and the grounds of that defense. Previously, there was no need for the defendant to even disclose the defense, but merely make the allegation that he does, he or she does have a bona fide defense. But that that has now been developed now and the courts actually require as much as a disclosure of the actual defense that the, that the defendant intends to raise in his plea in the summary judgment application in order for the court to make a dis, an informed decision. So that answering affidavit or the, or the opposing affidavit must be filed within five days before the hearing of the application. It may be supplemented by oral evidence, but only if the court gives permission for such oral evidence. And if that if the court does give that permission, the oral evidence may be led by the defendant. And that evidence by the defendant is not subject to cross-examination. It's merely evidence to stop summary judgment being awarded against the party, the defendant. Please make sure that your mics are in mute unless you want to say something. I hear someone's sound in the background. So the plaintiff bears the onus of proof. The, on, the plaintiff must prove that it is entitled to summary judgment, that it, that it has met the requirements of summary judgment and that the court must grant summary judgment in its favor. The standard of proof, once again, is on a balance of probabilities. It's a civil case, not like a criminal case where you need to do it beyond reasonable doubt. In a, it, is, it is only on a balance of probabilities. If the court believes that the plaintiff has proved his case, the court may make uh, a ruling that the defendant has not successfully defended the case and grant summary judgment in favor of the plaintiff, or that the defendant has shown that he has a bona fide defense uh, in respect of part of the claim or the whole claim. And whichever part the defendant has not shown a defense to, the court may grant judgment, summary judgment against the defendant for that portion which has not been proven. So therefore, the defendant will therefore, if the summary judgment is not successful, 
the defendant will be granted leave to defend the action and therefore to file the respective pleadings in respect of the defense, which is the plea and or special pleas. But if the court does not find that there's a bona fide defense to the summary judgment application, the court will grant summary judgment against the defendant on the whole claim or on the part of the claim that the plaintiff has proved. Now, an offer of settlement. Rule 18 provides that in any action in which a sum of money is claimed, either alone or with any other relief, the defendant may at any, any time unconditionally or without prejudice make an offer in writing to settle the plaintiff's claim. And where the defendant makes an offer in writing, if that defendant is represented by a legal representative, the offer must be signed by that defendant or by his legal representative and him or himself. And if the legal practitioner signs on behalf of the defendant, the legal practitioner must state that he or she is authorized to make such offer of settlement on behalf of that defendant. It must also state whether the offer is unconditional or without prejudice. And where an offer is made without prejudice, it may not be disclosed to the court in the event that it is refused. But if that offer is accepted, the parties may disclose the offer to the court and make it an unconditional offer that will be made an order of court. The offer made by the defendant may be a once-off offer. In other words, a global amount which includes the capital debt or the claim as well as all legal costs. It may also be a structured offer which specifies what the, which claim, the amount of the claim, plus costs and or interests on that amount, as well as the rate at which interest may be payable. It may also include the scale on which costs are offered. Normally, Costs are offered on a party and party scale. Or on. Exceptional circumstances where a party, a defendant agrees to pay costs on attorney and client scale. In many instances, you will find that. A defendant will after having offered. Made, made a, an offer in monetary terms and the plaintiff has accepted that offer. The parties do not agree on the issue of costs and on which scale such costs are to be paid. Then we call it a bun fight where the parties go to the magistrate, tell the magistrate this is the, 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 the claim. This is the claim which was offered by the defendant and the plaintiff has accepted it. We would like to make this offer an order of court, but the parties do not agree on the scale of costs, and we would like to argue the issue of costs. Each party will then, before the magistrate in open court, argue the issue of costs, stating why, stating on which scale they want the costs and for and the reasons for wanting costs on those on that scale. The court will then make a determination as to the scale on which 
the defendant should pay the costs of the plaintiff. I see a hand, Nikki Tasca. I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. Hi, I'm so sorry. That was uh, that was accidental. You are forgiven. You may put your hand down, Nikki. In litigation involving personal injury or the death of a person, a party may apply to court for an order that the defendant makes an interim payment in respect of a claim for past medical costs and past loss of income, which ar arose from the physical disability of the death of a person. So in a claim, in a case where a claim has been lodged against the road accident fund for personal injury, And the claim is for loss of support. Loss of support. Let's say this person who died in a car accident was the father, was, was the husband and father. And in the claim that was that was lodged with the road accident fund was included a claim for past loss of income and past medical costs to which the claimants are entitled. But because there is litigation that is pending, there's an action that is pending before the court, it may take a very long time for the court to come to a decision should the matter go to trial. The issue of liability is not an issue, is not disputed. But in, in cases of loss of support or loss of earnings claims, you need only prove 1% of negligence on behalf of the insured driver of the road accident fund. And where that is the case, such as in this case, in fact, the fault principle has been totally removed by the road accident fund. And loss of support claims are no longer defended. The plaintiffs then, the wife and the, survi the surviving wife and the children may apply to the court for an interim payment of that claim for loss of income, past loss of income. In other words, what would he have earned from the date of death until now? And also for medical expenses they incurred from the date of the accident until now they have the right in terms of rule 18a capital a to apply to the court for such interim payment and normally the defendants the raf do not the road accident fund does not def oppose such applications for such interim payment the issue it does become an issue where no request was made before going to court because normally the parties, the plaintiff's legal representative would write a letter to the road accident funds setting out a request for interim payment and the road accident fund not responding to such a request would lead to an application of this nature for interim payment. And in the application, which is supported by an affidavit, the, the the plaintiff will say or the applicant will say we I have requested an interim payment from the road accident fund of this amount of money. And these are the reasons why I believe I'm entitled to it. And. 
the road accident fund has refused or failed to even respond to my letter and forced me to come to court. And for that reason, I am seeking costs against the road accident fund for bringing this application. Had it not been for their failure or refusal or neglect to respond to my request in writing, I would not have come to court. And for that reason, I want costs, legal costs on an attorney and client scale. I do not believe that I should be out of pocket because of the supine attitude of the road accident fund. The court will gladly award costs on an attorney and client scale in those circumstances. And one of the things that the court will look at is is to the issue of liability or merits of the case. Because one of the things that the court encourages parties to do is where it becomes clear that a party does not have a defense. And in most cases, especially in. Loss of support claims against the road accident fund. It is impossible for a party to. To dream up a defense to a loss of support claim. And therefore, at the hearing of that application for interim payment, the defendant is obliged to concede liability in favor of the plaintiff as a first step before even the issue of the interim payment being considered. Right. Any questions? <clears throat> OK. Sorry, yes, uh, yes, I have a question. May I? It's Nasser again. Yes, Nasser. All right. Uh, with reference to a, a summary judgment, now you did mention that um, in an application for a summary judgment, and if it's based on a liquid document, we attach that liquid document to all the uh, necessary documents uh, when we make an application for summary judgment. So I just want to understand, why would one go down the route of uh, a summary judgment, uh, you know, uh, together with its uh, prior pleadings and all of that, if one has the option of actually going for a provisional sentence on a uh, on a liquid document, wouldn't the wouldn't the latter be the more appropriate route? Just a moment, please. All right. Just want to check something quickly. You see, when you are at the point of summary judgment, because you have to decide before instituting proceedings, if you are going to go simple summons route, combined summons route, or provisional sentence summons route. We are at the stage now of a simple summons. Let's say simple summons because it's a liquid document. And in the case of a simple summons, you have to go through the whole rigmarole because if the defendant defends the action, you have to file a declaration. And then they only plead to the declaration once it's filed. But in our scenario, we have gone combined summons with particulars of claim. And that is why we've gone for summary judgment because the defendant has now opted to defend the action and file a plea. 
<clears throat> because the rule requires that he first files a plea. <clears throat> so whether you so so whether you had the option of of going provisional sentence summons route is is neither here nor there because it's too late now that horse is bolted remember so it's now a question of the decision that you have made had he gone provisional sentence summons route he would not have had this issue and you are quite right when you say that but remember we are already at summary judgment stage now because he had already decided he's going the combined summons route and only then did he realize that the, the the defendant has now defended the action and he only has summary judgment left as as a cause of action a course not a cause a course of action does it make sense yeah it makes absolute sense uh, just, uh, so basically he's proceeded to a point where he can only go for a summary judgment but uh, again my my question is around whether the plaintiff the plaintiff's options at the start of uh, his uh, litigation would have favored going for a provisional sentence if he was sitting with a liquid document no the, for the sure. fact that he yeah okay for sure but i was just illustrating to you that it's because of the choice yeah. he made that is now in the situation that is in 100 percent understood had he chosen provisional sentence summons in the beginning, then he would not have been in the in in, in the position that he is in now. So yes, yeah, you are quite right. You are quite right. It's it's a question of deciding which route to take at that appropriate time. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you for your question. In when a defendant defends an action, it may transpire that in respect of the same cause of action or a related cause of action, the defendant has a counterclaim against the plaintiff. And I will make an example for you. The plaintiff sold and delivered to the defendant fuel on a, on a, on a, on a contract basis. And the agreement is that the defendant will pay his account to the plaintiff at the end of the month. So the plaintiff then fills in fuel the first month. At the end of the month, because he owns he owns a fleet of trucks. At the end of the month, his fuel bill comes to three hundred thousand rands. He then pays it on the first day of each of that month. The second month, his fuel bill comes to three hundred and fifty thousand rands. He then fails to pay for that fuel. After 30 days, another 30 days go by and he still fails to pay. The defendant then. The plaintiff then sues the defendant for 350,000 Rand for that fuel. When the defendant receives the summons, by the time the defendant receives the summons, he realized this, that one of his trucks had become damaged because water had been poured into his petrol into into the the tank of his of his truck instead of diesel and as a result of that the truck has the truck has now become damaged and the and the costs of repair of that damage amount to 100000 rands when the defendant pleads to the plaintiff's particulars of claim in that case the defendant may also raise a counterclaim or a claim in reconvention against the plaintiff for the damages suffered to the truck of the defendant 
That is called a claim in reconvention or a counterclaim. And those two claims will be considered at the same time at the hearing of the case. When the case, if the case does become defended, if the defendant does not admit liability for the 350,000 rands, the plaintiff will have to prove his case. And if the, and if the plaintiff cannot refute the claim of the defendant or, or does dispute the claim of the defendant for the damages to the truck, the defendant will have to lead evidence or provide evidence to the court to support his claim for the damage to his truck. I hope that clarifies um, counterclaim or claim and reconvention. Now, after the defendant has filed a plea, the plaintiff has the option to file a replication. And a replication is a pleading which is filed in response to a plea where it becomes apparent that the plea raises an issue which has not been adequately addressed in the particulars of claim or the summons. And I'll make an example. The defendant raises a special plea that the plaintiff's claim has prescribed and states the cause of action. The plaintiff now has the opportunity in the replication to state why the claim has not prescribed. May plead something to the following effect. In the special plea, the defendant alleges that the plaintiff's claim has prescribed. In support of this allegation, the plaintiff, the defendant has stated that the cause of action arose on 20th August 2018. This is disputed. The cause of action arose on the 12th of December 2021. This is the date on which the plaintiff became aware that he has a claim and has and such claim is against the defendant. That may distinguish that special plea, the replication. And that is an example of when it becomes necessary to file a replication. Unless there is an issue to be taken by the plaintiff, the plaintiff may not just willy-nilly file a replication if nothing has been placed in dispute. Now, because the, the, the defendant has instituted a counterclaim in our example with the fuel and the water and the truck that broke down, the plaintiff has an opportunity, or rather, the plaintiff is, 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 is obliged to file a plea to that counterclaim or the claim in reconvention. And in that plea, the plaintiff will, in a similar fashion as would a defendant to a particulars of claim, admit, deny, confess, and avoid the allegations made in the counterclaim or the claim in reconvention. And in that plea, or the replication for that matter, a party may not now raise new issues or a fresh claim or a cause of action. Now, after the plea has been filed or, or, or the replication has been filed, or when the period for filing a replication has, has expired, and no replication has been filed, pleadings are considered to be closed, called litis contestatio. 
And at this stage, the parties are no longer entitled to exchange pleadings. And you have to know what a pleading is. It summons particulars of claim, plea, counterclaim, special plea, replication. Those are considered pleas. And after those pleadings have been filed, no further pleadings may be filed. And now, when this has happened, the parties may now prepare for trial. And we are going to deal tomorrow with preparation for trial. But just quickly, Rule 29, a uh, Rule 21, capital A, deals with failure to deliver pleadings. We spoke about a notice of bar previously where a plea is not filed within the, the required time. We also spoke about a declaration. But you must serve that party with a notice of bar to tell them they have five more days within which to file this pleading. 20 days and the 10 days have expired, but now this notice of bar gives you five days only. And if you do not file within those five days, you are ipso facto or automatically barred from filing. Now, the only way after that, if you do not file within five days, it means you are barred. And the only way for you to now file your subsequent pleading is for you to bring an application for the upliftment of that bar. But you must give notice to the other side that this is you are this is your application and this is your affidavit with your reasons for uplifting of the bar. Now, Rule 55 capital A deals with amendment of pleadings. If you want to amend any pleading, you must give your opponent notice that you want to amend your pleading, and you must set out the respects in which you want to amend that pleading. And serve that on your opponent. It's a notice of intention to amend. And in your pleading, you must also say, if you do not object, if you wish to object to this amendment, you must do so within 10 days in writing, and you must set out the reasons for your objection. But if you do not object within 10 days of receiving this notice, the, the, the amendment will be so effective. And if there is no objection within 10 days, then you file the amended pleading that you wish to amend. But if there is an objection, and that objection is not valid, you may bring an application to the court to say, I've filed a notice of intention to amend. They've objected. They've not given sufficient grounds for the objection. I ask that the objection be struck out and that I be granted leave to file the amended pleading. And then immediately you may file your once and the court will then tell you that you may file your amended pleading thereafter. OK, that's that's called an interlocutory application because there are already existing an act and there's an existing action proceeding that's pending. Now there is. This is called an interlocutory. It's inside. It's within an existing action proceeding. And a party may amend pleadings right up until before judgment is issued by the court. So a trial may proceed. If the trial runs and a party wishes to amend, give the other party notice. And if it's a drastic, if it's a, it's, if it's if it's a necessity to amend during the trial, you ask the court to move an application urgently or immediately in court um, for that amendment. And the court may grant you the amendment should it feel that you are entitled to it. 
and your pleadings will be so amended, provided the judgment has not been delivered by the court. All right. Questions that concludes our defended actions. Any questions? Oh, it's me again. I hope I'm not getting boring. Uh, no, no, not at all. OK. Uh, on, on page 117, uh, we were going through uh, uh, Rule 18, Offer to Settle. Yes. And somewhere there it says, if the offer or tender is made, can you just define what you mean by tender? Because uh, I, I've had practical experience around this particular point. And uh, it's it's not very clear what is meant by tender. Uh, you know, I understood it to be an unconditional situation where somebody tenders payment, uh, and there can't be any conditions attached to that. And I, I I still fail to understand the difference between an offer and a tender. Okay. Just a moment for me, please. All right. I would say this is this is tautology. Because because an offer, you, you can also tender an offer. You make an offer or you tender an offer. I would I would take an issue with the usage of the word tender there. Because because I feel. You. An offer is something that you either make or you can say you are tendering an offer. I don't know if I'm I don't know how to explain it in more simpler terms. You said you had an issue with this. Previously. Yeah, if you uh, allow me a minute, I'll just catch it out. So um, I took action against a particular party uh, who was a who was a tenant uh, and he stopped paying his rent, but he continued paying his rent to his attorney. All right. And he said, but I've been tendering payment every month. Uh, I've been tendering but, payment. Yes. Uh, th that's that's how he argued it. All right. Obviously, I wasn't receiving it. So basically, his view was that his payments are being made and they will only be received by me pending the outcome of the case. And, and I argued saying, no, hang on. If you're tendering payment, it has to be absolutely unconditional and it has to come to me. <laughs> so uh, but but anyway, that uh, th this matter was settled out of court. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, it, it wasn't pursued, but I still fail to understand what he actually meant by saying I tendered payment when it wasn't actually received or meant to be received by me until the conclusion of the trial. I, I hear you. In in in, in right. this case, it seems that he was he was he was making payment to his attorney. Yes, which was, which was conditional upon you having proof that you're entitled to it. Yes, I think the usage of the word tend, tendering payment is 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 confusing in that regard. He tendered right. he tendered he tendered payment because it was conditional. He made it conditional that. It would go to his attorney and only to you when you've proven that it goes it, that it's that you've that it, that it, you're entitled to it. Yeah, yeah. Otherwise, if it was if it was if he was making that payment directly to you, he would not be tendering. Yeah. He would be making that payment to you. But because yes. he's paying it to his ten attorney, it's got a condition attached to it. That's why he's tendering it. Yeah, my my understanding was always that if. Uh, if the term tender is used, it should be unconditional. Yes. Uh, okay, I, I read this. I read this a while ago, and uh, it's just uh, recalling it from memory. <laughs> uh, 
uh, but but thanks for that. Uh, at, at least I have a better understanding of it. So I uh, yes. I, I hope my uh, yeah uh, no thank you, and I hope my colleagues listening also find some value in that question. I appreciate it. Thank you. No, most definitely, it's it's challenged my mind, and I will definitely also uh, look into it further. Thank you for that. Sir. All right, all right. Thank you, Mr. Mabuela. Yes, uh, advocate. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I agree with the latter uh, speaker. The word tender, uh, it's, it's, uh, it can mean many things. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this country, eh? So, yeah, it's, it's, yeah it's, it's quite a very tricky word to use. Uh, I, think, I think just on my side, on the issue of, of amendment of pleadings, I yes, think my, my, my concern will be, I mean, if the matter had, had gone far ahead, and now then there's a new amendment that is being introduced yes. it may it, it, it will appear that it may hamper uh, the progress uh, i mean in terms of uh, the work that one will have done in terms of preparation for the for for the trial and the issue is now even if it may attract uh, the cost order uh, should you win uh, the the case but may not be wholly compensatory. So it may mean that maybe the court may not allow it on that basis, or, or, or it will just have to be, uh, I should pin my hopes on the, on the compensation in terms of the cost order. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Not necessarily, because if, if a party amends or is given the right leave to amend during the proceedings. The opposing party also has the opportunity. To effect a consequential amendment. For instance, the defendant during the proceedings decides to amend his plea. That will. Sorry, the, the plaintiff decides to amend is particulars of claim. Out of necessity, the defendant must, and of fairness, the plaintiff must be given an opportunity to file a consequential plea to address the issue that has just been amended. So as much as facts may change and the pleadings may change, the opposing party is always given the opportunity to file a consequential pleading in response to what has been amended. In all fairness. I don't know if I've addressed your question. Yes, you did advocate. Thank you. Thank you, sir. On the issue of offer and tender, I will look into it and tomorrow I will I will I will have a more. Considered response for you. But thank you very much. And uh, good luck to those preparing for load shedding at nine. I'm one of them. And uh, have a good evening, all of you, until tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good night. Good thank night. you, Advocate. Good night. Okay. Bye bye. Thanks, Advocate. Hi, Advocate.